Hi, and welcome back to this, the 20th episode of my restoration, overhaul, modification of this little Chinese Sieg uh, 7x12 mini lathe. In this episode, we're going to be looking at getting the enclosure finished first, and then see where we go from there. Over lunch, I just rewatched uh, this old Tony's variable speed Manila the review. At the end he talked about uh, maybe CNCing his one as well, so I look forward to that series once he finishes his Mahu. Huh? You know Nico, this channel's number one fan, was here the other day and he had a little bit of a play with this saddle which is lubricated with um, 220 weight whey oil. Kind of close to a light sort of runny honey and he was saying, man you've got to find some way to explain to the the people watching this just how awesomely smoothly this this runs, you know. It feels like it's running on ball bearings. There's absolutely no metal-to-metal -metal contact at all. Yeah, there's, there's obviously resistance because the oil's quite thick, but it certainly feels really nice the way it moves. There are two little screw holes which I've put in the, in the headstock. One up here and one down there just to hold these, these guards nice and firmly in place. So to find those holes, I've just made up a tiny little metric three transfer punch so basically I just put an angle on the end of a of a screw I'll screw it in just give it a light tap with a hammer to give me a, a center I think I need to clean up the paint first though Although it's a bit of a pain, I have uh, assembled it all with screws and washers and nuts because it gives me the advantage that I can then take it back apart again. There are a couple of joints I did with um, pop rivets, but only ones that I have no intention of taking apart again on the on the fold down mechanism, fold down cover. Yeah, so first up this week I've been working on the car. Had to replace the brakes and just give it a service. So that's now finished, and now. The big job starts and that's the shower basin. Unfortunately it was stuck down with uh, tile cement or grout and never really adhered properly. So it got kind of soft and bouncy after a year or so. I did a half ass board shop repair a few years ago uh, drilling up from the basement and then injecting that blue polyurethane foam up to try and glue it down which to be fair did work for about four years but it's not a permanent solution and now it's started leaking so it's time to rip it all out seal it all up properly and get this thing installed properly before this cover goes on I need to fit the Z lead screw Just adjusting the gibbs to get a nice smooth travel along the bed.
you see here as I tighten up the, the apron, you can see how it pulls the lead screw up. So I'll put a clock on that, measure how far the screws or the apron is pulling the ball screw up, and then make a shim to space it down by that amount. So that's set up now, I'll just zero the clock, and as we tighten up, you can see it's pulling the lead screw up by about four tenths of a millimeter. So that's what I'm going to need to shim it up by. Well, after a bit of scrounging around, I found this piece of brass shim stock, which is 0.3 of a millimeter thick, and some beer can, which I think, yep, it's close enough to 0.1. I think this beer can was Eger beer from Salzburg, which I don't even really like, so this is probably a good use for it. Now thinking a little bit more about it, 0.4 millimeters would be the minimum thickness shim to bring it up to height, but there's a bit of slop in that uh, rolled ball screw, so I think I'll go a wee bit further and use two layers of this brass shim stock to bring it up by 0.6 of a millimeter and see how that looks. wondering how I'm going to put the holes in these. I guess the options are either I try punching holes, if I've got an 8mm punch I'll have to have a look, or I clamp them between two pieces of metal and just drill through with a normal drill, or I clamp them between two, another two pieces of metal and drill them with a step drill. What do you guys think? How would you do it? Well, punching's off the menu because the only punch I could find is too small. This is just a six millimeter. Maybe enough to start the hole though. Let's have a look. I'll just try it out on one of the offcuts. Yeah, not too bad. Yeah, that's actually a good starter hole because from six, it then it's only one step with the uh, step drill to take it up to nominal. So I think I'll do that. I decided to take them out an extra size to 10 millimeters just to make it nice and easy to get them lined up with the bolts. The holes aren't critical anyway. Well that wasn't perfect but it did take most of the burr off. It made the rest very easy to remove.
Okay, so that was just about right because I can now tighten it without it distorting. Seems everyone wants to see motion, so let's fake it, shall we? On Thursday, I bought a new tire for the car and took that out to get it mounted. So I drove all the way out to the friend who's got a wheel balancing and mounting equipment. One of the wheel bolts on the car is one of those security ones with a kind of a weird sort of a, almost looks like Torx, but it's more rounded. And it's just very special sort of uh, socket you need to put on it to get it to open. So of course, I'd been using that in the driveway to change the brakes and I cleaned up the brake job and what do I do with all the tools? Piled them high on the uh, bandsaw of course, as I always do. Yeah, next day I drove out to get the new tyre mounted on that rim. Drove half an hour, got there, realised I'd left the uh, security uh, socket still sitting on my bandsaw. Went out the next day and got it done. Guess that was all a waste of a couple of hours. Another. Just open up that hole of it. Oh, I just remembered I was telling you the story about the about forgetting to take the security bolt out when I changed the tires. I forgot to tell you the end of that. I think I've got CRS. Can't remember shit. What was I talking about? Oh, it doesn't matter. Here I'm just putting the window back into the um, cover. This is just a piece of um, normal plex plexiglass from the local building store. They get scratched up after a while, so I figured I'd make them pretty much replaceable. Yeah, as you can see, when I did the painting, I forgot to paint this strip in the new corporate colours. I think I've shown you these before, but this is probably the most beautiful tool I've ever bought. It's a set of um, riveting and dimpling dies I got from Aircraft Spruce a few years ago. Beautifully finished forgings. Uh, the dies just slip in. Click that in the bottom. Click this one in the top. And then this bottom die is on a screw thread, so you can adjust the clamping force with that, the material thickness. Another slight design error here. Ideally, I'd like the scr strip screwed in so that it's easily replace, uh, removable to easily replace the purse bags. However, this across here sits on here, so I need it also to be very low profile. Um, it's easy enough to drill out rivets, so what we'll do is we'll just rivet in place. Once again, using the same rivet squeezes. Now I've replaced the um, dimpling dies with just normal flat riveting dies or squeezing dies. I want these pretty flat. That'd be, you wouldn't accept that on an aircraft that flat, but this is not an aircraft. Well, the fit on this side is 
not too bad. It's a wee bit loose here on the top, but I can probably tweak that down a little bit. Whereas the fit on this side is not so good. Um, you can see this top distance across here is too long now. I think the culprit is these two screws. They're both slightly off where they should be. So I'm probably gonna have to overlace these holes a little and move this hole this way and that hole this way so that the two sheets close better. You can see from the joggle and the gap here that I really didn't get those holes in the right spot. That's what you have overlaced holes for. So with those two screws taken out, it looks like the culprit's really the back one more than the front one. Yeah, so I just need to move that hole in the back and the back plate over a little bit. I don't really feel bad doing this. When I was under the car changing the oil, I had a quick look and a lot of the fasteners and body panels and stuff on cars also have pretty huge um, slotted holes in that to make it all easy to fit and easy to align. So I guess we're in good company with this stuff. Now you may have seen that I don't have enough fasteners to finish the job at this stage. That's actually because of one of the very few good habits which I've got. Whenever you remove fasteners, if they're damaged, throw them out. I used to hate when working on aircraft, you know, you'd be on a shift three o'clock in the morning, you have to remove some access panel, and you find all the Phillips uh, heads are all totally, totally worn out and chewed out. If you keep them, you'll definitely be tempted to put them back in. So, best thing, throw them out straight away. Then at the end, you'll be forced to get some new ones. Well, that's now the enclosure installed. As you can see, it just folds up like that. I've had it this way for years. There's better ways of doing it, I'm sure, with sliding doors and better control of flood coolant and stuff. But to be honest, I've never used flood coolant on a lathe. Um, just a little bit of uh, coolant on a brush is normally plenty and I've always found this was quite a good solution. It's enough to keep the swarf under control. Well, that empties another uh, ice cream container that can go back on the stack. Now I was talking to our number one fan, Nico, yesterday and he was suggesting that maybe I should talk a little about how CNC machines work as maybe not everyone's familiar with how they actually work. So let's say you want to turn a Morse taper. How will you do that on a manual lathe? Well, I guess the easiest way of doing that would be is set the top slide to the angle of the Morse taper, probably using a dial gauge along the, an existing taper to set the angle, and then you just use the top slide to cut the taper. We need the top slide so that we've only got a single axis to move, because humans are crap at coordinating two axes at once. A CNC lathe doesn't need a top slide. Now just imagine that we can cut a Morse taper by coordinating exactly one turn of the horizontal rack with one turn of the cross slide. Okay, it's not exactly of course, not even close, but let's just for the sake of argument pretend it's like that. So if we were able to keep these hands perfectly synced together, then we wouldn't need the top slide, would we? We could just cut it like this. Highly theoretically, because if you look at it, there's always some sort of jerkiness in this movement, move in this motion. One hand's always a little slower than the other, a little faster. And that's super easy, that was just one to one. Imagine if this was 40 taper and we had to go, let's say, three rotations of the cross slide for one rotation of the saddle. You know, this is where we're getting into, okay, for every 180, uh, 120, we need to have done a whole revolution. Whoop, too fast. So, as you can see, humans are not really capable of this. 
there's probably somebody out there who can cut a, cut a perfect Morse taper, but there's no way you'd be able to do this every day, day in, day out, for every Morse taper the, the world's ever used. What we need is a different solution. But we all know that computers are much better at counting than we are. This is the little single board computer I'm going to be using to, as the brain of uh, this mini lathe. Now, when, as you saw when I tried to coordinate this motion, it always ends up a bit jerky, right? You may be able to move one hand wheel nice and smoothly, or mostly smoothly, and you see that with the chips that you take off. If you're only moving one axis, you can generally take off a nice, quite continuous chip. But as soon as you start trying to coordinate two of them, it's jerky. One starts, one stops. And that also happens with computers. We've all experienced our computer locking up, waiting to do something, stopping to inspect its navel. So part of the task of setting up a computer for a CNC is to make sure that motion control gets the highest priority. And that's called real-time operation. We don't want it stopping in the middle of a cut to renew its subscription to Rotary SMP's YouTube channel, for example, or to ask you to install a new driver. As you can see, any jerkiness would of course be a blemish on the part. So, assuming we've got uh, our computer running with a real-time operating system, so that it doesn't stop to look at its navel, we should be able to get nice and clean and constant motion commands from the computer. Now the next thing we need to talk about is open loop or closed loop control systems. Think of it this way. You had a couple too many beers, you get up in the middle of the night and you need to bleed Percy. Now, you could turn the light on, see where you're going and navigate your way to the bathroom. That's a closed loop system. But you'll probably get in trouble for waking someone with a light. The other option is you use an open loop system. So rather than turning the light on, you know it's four steps from the edge of the bed to the door, then turn left, another four steps into the uh, bathroom, drop your dax and have a shot at the bowl. That would be an open loop system. Now just as in real life where the confidence that beer adds <laughs> doesn't necessarily lead to an increased performance at hitting the bowl. In the CNC world, open loop systems are not generally considered as good as closed loop systems. So what do I actually mean by that? With, a, with an open loop system, the computer controls the motors, my hands, which are moving the axes but has no feedback as to whether they're actually doing what the computer's telling them to do. So we send out signals to move just like this, and we assume it happens. If it does, you get a good part. If, we, if it doesn't, you find out your part's scrapped. With a closed loop system, there'll be some form of a measuring instrument installed. Maybe it's a, a linear scale, maybe it's just encoders, which give feedback to the computer to tell them whether the, the movement that's been ordered has actually ha taken place and whether it happened accurately. For the mini lathe, I'm just going with an open loop system. Real CNC machines, such as the Mahu, all use uh, closed loop systems. So, I mean, if you're interested in me doing a video on uh, closed loop control or how I modified the Mahu, drop me a line in the, in the comments section. I've been thinking that once I finish this mini lathe project, the next thing should probably be a series on how I retrofitted the Mahu to Linux CNC. So we've established we need a computer, our little Gigabyte GBase something or other, GBase 3150, that's going to be running Linux CNC. Now, a computer can't output muscle power to move a motor. So it's, we're going to need some motor drivers, in this case, these stepper motor drivers. Now we're going to need multiple things to happen at the same time. For example, turning the lead screw along the bed and turning the lead screw across the bed at the same time to turn our taper. Computers used to have parallel ports. They were the old printer ports, but 
they've pretty much gone away and they were also a pretty slow interface. So to enable this computer brain of the CNC to communicate with the various peripheral things that need to happen, I've got this effectively a breakout board. It's a bit smarter than that, but we'll call it a breakout board. This is a Mesa uh, 7i96. Does a few different things, but it connects to the computer through a normal Ethernet cable. And it's got a pro its own processor to ensure perfectly smooth real-time stepping of the motors. And a bunch of connectors to connect to things such as motor drivers, uh, outputs to the VFD, inputs from sensors, etc. There are a few common interfaces of how you, in how you drive motors from a computer. Um, I'm going to be using step and direction which is very common for stepper-based systems. Basically, you break down your motion into some number of steps. Let's call it a thousand steps per millimeter. And the computer, when it wants to order motion, will just tell it, okay, step, step, step. And if you're doing two axes, they may be going step, 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 step. And that, one, that, that way, one axis will be moving four times as fast as the other one. Whenever you want to change in direction, a different pin sends a direction signal. So you go step, 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 direction, and now go step, 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 and come back the opposite way. So that stream of step and direction signals gets fed into the motor drivers as low voltage, you know, 5 volt digital signals with no real current. And these take us an additional high voltage source. In this case, I'm going to be feeding it, uh, I think, 36 volt DC. And these provide the commutation to the motor. Rather than a stepper motor having a, like a physical commutator like a normal DC motor, they just have windings and a bunch of individual wires to the windings. And the stepper driver energizes winding A, winding B, reverse A, reverse B, simplified, to make the motor turn. To control the spindle, we've got a VFD, but the VFD can only accept um, 0 to 10 volt analog signals as a speed command, whereas the computer and the Mesa card can only output 0 to 5 volt pulse width modulated signals. So this little widget does nothing other than receives the uh, 0 to 5 volt pulse width modulated signal and converts it to a 0 to 10 volt analog output. So this will be controlling the VFD's speed input. Well it was a busy week and once again I didn't get as much done as I'd hoped but that's life. If you like the series I'd appreciate a thumbs up and a subscribe. It's our way of telling YouTube that that's a good bit of content, gives us encouragement. Thanks a lot for watching and I look forward to seeing you again next week.